Chapter 24 Another vibration rocked the SV-52. The craft slid sideways through space as though something had pushed it. Talby's HUD flashed with more alerts, but the radiation warning had turned from red to yellow. Had the creature left? He touched the thrusters again after checking the cam feeds. It had left. Gunny had managed to get the damn thing off him. Shit, Talby said. Where is it going? After a few more seconds, he managed to stabilize the SV-52 and point it back toward Mira. Then he saw what was about to happen. The giant starfish-like creature had changed its trajectory and its focus. It was heading straight for the skiff at a terrifying speed. Plachette rounds exploded in front of it, around it, hell, everywhere. The skiff blinked again and again as the cannon fired volley after volley. Several of the rounds detonated directly on the monster, but it either didn't feel any pain or didn't care. You pissed it off good and proper, Talby muttered. He checked his weapons, all green, locked and loaded. Sneering, he pushed the damaged SV-52's throttle and headed toward the creature. It was closing in on the skiff. Gunny had maybe five seconds before the thing was on top of them. The constant cannon fire had slowed it down, and now it was dodging from side to side with impossible grace. I'm on at six, Talby said through the comms. Went, try not to hit me. No response. Either the creature's radiation field scrambled the signal, or Went just didn't have time to talk. He did, however, adjust the cannon's aim, the rounds exploding slightly higher or lower than his position. Talby lined up the SV-52's cannons and closed within 20 meters of the creature. Taking the shot, Talby said, and activated the cannons. Tritium flechette rounds streaked from the cannons like comets, their rocket engines burning bright in the Kuiper Belt's shadowy twilight. The creature, shimmering with a haze of radiation, either didn't know he was behind it or didn't consider him a threat. Regardless, it should have paid more attention. The round struck its body dead center. The space around the thing glittered with heavy water instantly freezing in the near absolute zero, but not before most of the liquid hit its back. The radiation haze sparkled before seeming to disperse in a lick of eldritch color. Its arms, pointed at the skiff mere meters in front of it, spread like flower petals. The thing tried to change direction, but with his fire on its back and Wentz rounds punching into its front, it could do little to avoid the multiple fusillades. The starfish, apparently out of options, changed its trajectory and slammed into the hole some ten meters from the skiff. Black debris scattered from its wounded shell, the flecks of strange material floating in space like lumps of coal. Went changed the cannon's aim and fired more rounds at the thing. The creature's arms rose before smashing into the hull as it tried to get inside the safety of Mira's deserted decks. Talby wasn't going to let that happen. He shifted the SV-52 until he was a mere eight meters from the creature. He fired two more shots, aiming directly at its flank where the arms met its center. The first round obliterated the joint, sending the amputated limb tumbling through space just above the hull. The second round impacted half a meter from the same spot, but on the creature's shell. The weakened carapace exploded into black debris and shining, silvery liquid. Ropes of the substance whipped upward from its pulverized body back toward him. Talby punched the four thrusters, and the support craft flew backward and up, away from the acidic entrails. Gunny, he yelled. Get out of there! When the creature turned toward the skiff, Gunny's balls turned a little more than hard, frozen marbles. It moved like something out of a horror hollow, its arms slithering through space as it lined itself up to eat them. Wint was still firing at it, but even he was caught off guard when the thing opened its blacker, the Black Maw. A long stream of silver liquid erupted from the creature's center and shot down at the skiff. Like screamed over the comms as the alien venom hit the gunnel and splattered into fine droplets. Gunny turned toward Like and opened his mouth in horror. Drops of silver, so small they were barely visible, collected on Like's suit like beads of rain on waxed metal. Vapor rose from Like's suit, condensing in frozen clouds. Gunny's HUD flashed with a squad warning. Like was losing compression. Fuck! Gunny yelled. He demagged his boots and pushed off toward Like, barely conscious that he was now flying just below Wint's cannon. The flechette streaked centimeters above his shoulder as Wint continued firing at the creature. All Gunny could focus on was Like, and the young Marine was about to die. Like's rifle, still maglocked to his left arm, aimed wildly in the air around him as he tried to wipe off the liquid. Vapor drifted up from the fingers on his right glove. No! Gunny yelled, but he knew it was too late. 
The gloves, the least armored portion of the suit, were already dissolving. The kid had maybe 10 seconds before his suit lost integrity. The Marine was in full panic, the rifle firing wildly as his fingers tightened on the trigger. An errant flechette round streaked just past Gunny's shoulder. Another detonated a mere meter from the skiff. He reached like and batted the rifle from his hand. The weapon spun away from them into space, just before Gunny's HUD flashed with a red squad warning. Like had lost compression. Gunny screamed at him over the mic, but there was no response. The chest and shoulder area where the first droplets of silver liquid had hit were now dissolving. He could see the strands of Atmos steel weave beneath a quickly disappearing outer shell. The kid was dead, and there wasn't a fucking thing he could do about it. Like's arms twitched before wrapping around his throat, as if applying pressure could somehow keep the vacuum and near-absolute zero temperature from filling his suit. They twitched three more times before his body went still. Gunny Mag locked himself to the gunnel, his arms outstretched to the dead marine. The skiff vibrated again and again from Wentz's fire, but he barely noticed. He couldn't see the look of horror he knew lay beneath the helmet, nor the heavy layer of frost that undoubtedly covered the dermis. The boy's eyes, probably as wide open as his mouth set in a scream, would be little more than solid, frozen rocks. Fuck! Gunny yelled. He kicked the body from the skiff and turned to face the attacker. That's when he saw Talby open up. The creature had given up attacking the skiff and was trying to dig itself into the deck. Between Talby and Went, the thing didn't have a chance. Gunny pointed his rifle to add to the cover fire when a part of the creature's circular body broke apart in a shatterstorm of black flakes and silver droplets. Coiled strands of shimmering liquid escaped its body and drifted toward the skiff. Went started to yell, but Gunny was already in motion. He kicked off the gunnel and headed to the pilot chair. As his body flew by the cannon mount, he realized he was going too high. He was going to float right by the front of the skiff and into space beyond it. He flipped his magnetics to full and braced himself as his feet dragged him to the skiff's deck. His bones vibrated from the impact and he grunted in pain. Without sitting down, he made a block connection to the skiff's controls and fired the aft thrusters. The skiff bolted forward, just as the silvery ropes flew past where Wentz's head had been. Gunny! Talby yelled. Here, sir! Gunny said in a less than even voice. He took short sips of air, doing his best to keep his panting from the comms. Status? Fucked, Gunny growled. Like is dead. He's dead? Went asked over the channel. Gunny was silent for a moment, waiting for the Lance Corporal to say something else, but he didn't. Gunny turned the skiff in a wide arc until its four pointed once again at SNR Black. Talby's SV-52 hovered a few meters above the hull and less than two meters from where the creature had met its end. The creature's body, tethered by one attached arm that had penetrated the hole, slowly floated upward until its ragged, pulverized middle seemed to dangle at the end of the remaining appendage. Gunny ground his teeth. They hadn't killed it fast enough. No, he hadn't been fast enough. He squeezed his eyes tight for a moment, doing his best to ignore the volcano of acid churning in his stomach and the sense of loss and failure threatening to shut down every nerve ending in his body. Wasn't your fault, Gunny. Talby said over a private connection. He said nothing for a moment, wishing he could flip up his helmet and rub the tears from his eyes. Thank you, sir, he said in a clipped voice. Doesn't help much. No, Talby said. The lieutenant's voice sounded as monotonic and lifeless as his own. Can we retrieve his body? Gunny checked his cam feeds until he saw the silhouette of Like's suit slowly tumbling toward Mira's aft. We can, sir, Gunny said. I just don't know how much of that acid shit we'd have to deal with. Might be a contamination hazard. Talby hissed. I'll grab it, he said. In the net. We'll bring it back and figure out what to do. Very good, sir, Gunny said. Get back to the ship, Gunny. We have work to do. Aye, sir, Gunny said. Talby broke the connection. The SV-52's lights flashed over the skiff as Talby rotated the craft in the direction of Lyke's body and slowly accelerated away. Get your fucking shit together, Marine, he told himself. Went, he said. Aye, Gunny. We're getting the fuck out of here. Keep sharp. Aye, Gunny. He stared out at SNR Black. The ship glowed like a beacon in the darkness, its exterior floodlights still raining down photons around the abandoned spindle. Like died for nothing, he thought. The skiff trundled slowly back toward the ship, as if in a funeral procession. Chapter 25 when Callie had been 13, her father had taken her to the Scaparelli crater mine where he worked. 
It was the first time she'd ever stepped into one of the massive complexes built below ground. The SFGov Atmo co-owned site had tunnels and caverns nearly one kilometer beneath the crater's surface. She begged and begged for him to let her see one of the mine shafts, and the platforms where humans and AIs worked together to find and collect precious resources. He had, and when she saw the darkness stretching beneath one of the platforms, she'd suddenly become aware she was below the planet's surface, millions and millions of metric tons of rock and sand waiting to break the supports and rush down atop her, to crush her, pulverize her, and grind her into microscopic bits. She'd nearly had a panic attack, but she managed to hide it from her father, at least long enough for her to make it back up to the main complex, before excusing herself and expelling the contents of her stomach into a toilet. Her father, an SFMC Marine, helped guard the facility as well as rescue any personnel that might become trapped or injured in the mine. From that day on, she'd been terrified if he was late coming home from work, not to mention if there were news reports of cave-ins or casualties at the mine. Every time one of those came over the hollow stream, she just remembered the yawning tunnel and the evil darkness that had threatened to sweep over her. This ship, with its endless corridors, reminded her of that tunnel, and although the science section didn't seem to consume their light the same way the rest of the ship had, the childhood memory started bouncing into her thoughts whenever she closed her eyes. Their safe haven was behind them. Every step she took brought them closer to the next room, and every step kicked the memory to the top of her consciousness. Kelly bit her lip until it hurt images falling away as bright pain shot across her nerve endings. The next room, she thought. The next room could be better. It doesn't have to be as doom-ridden as the last. Hell, there might be another comm station they could use. Or maybe some explanation of what the hell was going on here. A sneer crossed her face. Yeah, she thought. And maybe there will be a unicorn. Everything okay, boss? Carb asked. Kelly flinched. Yeah, she said, doing her best to keep the fear out of her voice. Why'd you ask? Dickerson cleared his throat. Because you slowed down, he said. No, Kelly said. Everything's fine. Hatch is just up ahead. Copy, Dickerson said. Great, Kelly thought. Focus! Her lip throbbed and she noticed the coppery taste of blood in her mouth. Yep, that was really going to help her talk later when her lip was swollen to the size of a mouth guard. Kelly pressed forward, her helmet lights illuminating the recessed hatch for the decontamination chamber. She stood from her crouch, wincing at the sensation of her knees and back popping. When this is over, she told herself, you're going to spend an entire day in the tub back at Trident Station. Right, like getting back there was ever going to happen. Shut up and move, she said to herself. Kelly cleared the corridor ahead as best she could before pivoting to face the hatch. Through a block command, she activated her left side camera and put the feet on her HUD. She had to focus on the hatch, of course, but if there was motion on her flank, she was damned well going to see it. Dickerson, cover the rear. Carb, watch my flank. Ah, boss. Kelly sighed with relief as Carb moved behind her. Why did she feel as though the ship's walls were closing in on her, or that the illumination from her lights was dimming? Her eyes flicked to her O2 supply. She was still in the green, but with her broken HUD sensor, the damn thing could have said she was full, and she couldn't trust it. Not enough to bet her life, anyway. Dickerson, what's your O2 status? Uh, he paused for a moment. 30 minutes until red line, but that's probably because we've been taking it slow. We get into another few firefights, I doubt it will last that long. Copy, Kelly said. It was a good point. She'd asked Dickerson because of the four of them, he easily consumed the most oxygen. Wasn't always a good thing to be a large man. Okay, if we don't find an O2 station in this room, we're heading back to that safe area. Ah, Corp. Dickerson said. The walls seemed to cave in toward her and then elastic band back into a reality. Vertigo sent shivers down her back and made her stomach crawl. She closed her eyes, tried to tell herself it wasn't real. Hell, she felt like she was floating off the deck. She opened her eyes again. The walls elastic banded again. Harder. The images of reality shimmered and then solidified. She stared, her body completely frozen with terror. A moment passed, then another. She shook with a start as if coming awake during a bad dream. Her eyes flicked to her side cam. Carb had dropped her rifle from one hand, the weapon's barrel pointed at the deck. Her helmet lights, however, were pointed directly down the corridor. A check of her rear cam feed showed her Dickerson, frozen like a statue, his rifle auto-locked to the palm of his hand. Kelly tried to speak, but all she managed was a single, drawn-out syllable. 
After clearing her throat, she finally found her voice. Squad, did you see that? Dickerson snapped out of his paralysis, the rifle immediately back in his hands. Carb had done the same. If you mean... Dickerson stammered. If you mean the goddamned walls moving around, yeah. After a moment without reply from Carb, Kelly frowned. Carb, did you see it? I... Her voice broke off into silence. Yeah, Dickerson said. She saw it. What about you, Elliot? Saw the floor and left corridor, he said. The rest of you fuckers got really stretched and then snapped back. What in the void? Dickerson said. Yeah, Kelly thought. What indeed? Or better yet, why? They hadn't experienced this on their journey to the bridge. Unless, she thought, it's been a gradual change, so subtle we didn't even notice until now. She tried to remember how wide the corridors had been before they started their way to the science section. Had the ship's corridors seemed to close in on them over the past hour? She didn't think so. But she started feeling more cramped and claustrophobic, that was for sure. What do we do now? Dickerson asked. Let's check the room, Kelly said. If that effect is just in the corridor, I want to get out of it as fast as possible. Copy that, Carb said. I, I don't know what the fuck that was, but I don't want to have it happen again. Damn near puked in my helmet. No shit, Dickerson said. Kelly managed to grin. At least they'd all experienced the same sensations. Something in common, anyway. She couldn't describe what she'd felt, as if her mind refused to call up the memories. She hoped for their sake they hadn't experienced it, too. Not like that. But she had a bad feeling that's exactly what froze all of them in their tracks. Okay, Kelly said. Dickerson, get up here. You're the corridor detail. Both you and Carb, she amended after a moment. The jumble of thoughts racing across her mind made it difficult to focus, to think. Too many questions, too much fear. She bit her sore lip and the thoughts disappeared in a red haze. Kelly shook her head, another bright bolt of pain rocketing across her skull. Her vision gradually cleared. I'm going to open the hatch. You two take up positions three meters in either direction. Give this thing some room, just in case. After the two Marines acknowledged the command, Kelly hunted for a manual release, but found none. If she wanted in, she'd have to cut in. It had taken three beam cutters to cut through the last one. She knew their last cutter didn't have enough power to create a large enough hole. Maybe she could make one large enough for her or Carb to crawl through. Maybe but definitely not Dickerson. Not only that, she told herself, but cutting through had taken a long time. They'd have to head back to the room they'd just left soon for more O2. In other words, they didn't have time for this. She was about to step back and call it when her eyes caught sight of a recessed panel in the hatch frame above her. She partially demagnetized her boots and the weightlessness immediately made her stomach drop. Kelly waited just a beat before tapping her toes on the deck. She floated higher toward the panel. Reaching out, she activated a mag glove on the hatch frame and stuck fast to the metal. Pushing on the frame cut her forward momentum and kept her from moving into a horizontal position. She tapped the panel with the fingers of her free hand. The metal slid down, exposing a bright red crank. I think this is the manual release for something, she said. Or maybe a power generator. For something? Carb echoed. I don't like the sound of that, boss. Dickerson's voice broke through the comms, flat and devoid of emotion. Think that's a good idea, Corporal? We need to find out what's in there that bad? She was about to reply when the world shrank in on her before popping back to normal. When she caught her breath, she could only whisper, See that? Shit, Carb said. I felt it. Let's get the fuck out of here. Dickerson groaned. God damn it, we have to get down this corridor to get to the port side escape pods. Kelly brought up the schematics. She stared at their position on the map. Backtrack! She said, we head to the safe room, get more O2, backtrack to the three-way branch and take one of them. Elliot snorted. And what fresh hell are we going to find? I don't know, Kelly said, but I don't think we want to go that way. We'd risk the phenomenon getting worse. Copy that, Dickerson said inside. With you, Corporal. Good, let's move. <laughs>